Won't you open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 16? We're going to read from verse 1. Then they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month of their departure, why don't they just say two and a half months? Could have saved them a whole sentence. Two and a half months later, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. You know they weren't really grumbling against Aaron and Moses. You know they were really grumbling against God. But they didn't really want to go to God. So they said, well, let's just go to Aaron and Moses and we can grumble then. Let them go and grumble to God. The sons of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. People are such big talk. You know when things don't go your way, have you ever noticed how people have got so much to say about stuff and they say things and you think, you're talking such nonsense. But the melodrama comes out. (laughs) Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill us this whole assembly with hunger. I want to speak to you this morning on a subject that I've titled, Dominion Follows Rulers. Dominion Follows Rulers. There are a few key stories in the Old Testament that everybody knows about. Everybody knows about Noah's Ark and everybody knows about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. And the story about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt is is quite an interesting one because there are so many lessons that we can learn. You know, when I read things like this, I try and say, what is the personal application in my life? And I try and understand where it's coming from from that. But if you look at the children of Israel, there they were enslaved in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. And they'd been praying, God, please deliver us. We want our freedom. We want to get out of Egypt. We want to get out of this. We don't want to be slaves anymore. We want to be free. Help us, get us free. And so God works a whole series of miracles and he brings this plague and that plague and the next plague and eventually Pharaoh says, that's it, get rid of them, throw the baggage out. So he flushes the whole bunch of them out and says, you're out of here. And off they go and they rush off and they're running away and then Pharaoh suddenly thinks, well, maybe I've changed my mind. Hold on. So he sends his army after them and says, wait, bring them back again. So they're running along and they turn around and all of a sudden they say, look at us, we're on our way, we're on our way out, we're almost at freedom. We turn around and what do we see behind us? The Egyptians coming after us. God, what are you gonna do? God, we're gonna die. You brought us out of Israel. Now we're gonna die because we have no safety and no security. And so they start grumbling against God. So God makes a plan and he delivers them and they get out of that and they come through the Red Sea and they go into the desert. And they get into the desert, and once they get into the desert, they start moaning and grumbling because, God, you brought us out of Egypt. It was such a wonderful place, and we had so much to eat, and we had such a good life there. Now you bring us into the desert. You bring us into the wilderness, and look, we've got no food. We're going to (laughs) die. And God provides food for them. And then they carry on a little bit later, and then, God, I have to understand, Egypt was, wasn't as bad as we made it out to be. In actual fact, it was a pretty good place, and we had an abundance of everything. And one thing we could do is we could drink all we wanted, and there's no water here, and we're all about to die of thirst. God, do something for us, because we're about to die. <laughs> and so God provides water for them. The wilderness is an interesting place. Because when we get into the wilderness, we move into a place where we become very much aware of our need. And when we become aware of our need, we're always going to God with our need. We're always approaching God with our need. The thing about it is, every single one of us is going to go through a wilderness experience. And I've got some even better news for you. You're going to go through more than one. (laughs) How about that? But the wilderness experience is an important experience in your life. You want to go through a wilderness experience. Everybody teaches you that you don't want to go through a wilderness experience. You want to go through a wilderness experience. And I'll tell you why. Because a wilderness experience is all about personal growth and personal expansion. 
You see, what God wants to do is God wants you to experience and begin to live life at a new dimension. And every time God is inviting you and introducing you to a new dimension of life, he is elevating the bar in your life. And he is introducing you to to areas of, of what he's provided for you. And as you begin to step into that, you suddenly recognize the fact that I have a deficit in my life. I don't have the ability to move into what God has provided for me. And I recognize the fact that I become very much dependent on him. When you walk into a wilderness experience, all of a sudden you recognize the fact that a wilderness experience does not provide the resources for life. A wilderness experience does not provide the resources to sustain you. You don't have the water, you don't have the food. And so you become totally dependent on God. And you start saying, unless I'm able to get God to perform in the situation, unless God is able to intervene in my situation and meet my need, there is no plan B. You see, the problem with the wilderness experience is you put, it puts you in a place where you're not able to go back to where you were. I know too much to go back to that place. And in many instances, the doors are closed. The bridges are burned. And I can't go back to where I was. But I'm not comfortable where I am. It's not what I expected it would be. It's not what I had anticipated it should be. And when I go through a wilderness experience, all of a sudden I recognize the fact that I have a deficit in my life. And God is saying to us, okay, So how are we gonna grow and how are we gonna move forward from this point? Wilderness experiences are healthy for us and they're good for us because they're expansive and they enlarge our capacity for life. They position us in places where we're able to rule and reign in dimensions that we were not able to do before. Wilderness experiences are important for us. Part of the reason that we go through a wilderness experience and we struggle so much with it is because our perspectives are so different to God's. When we get into a wilderness experience, we become overtly aware of our need and our focus is our need. When you get into a wilderness experience, God's perspective and God's focus is you. And so I'm sitting there and I'm saying, God, can you see the predicament I'm in? God, do you realize that my marriage is in such a bad place and I need you to come in and I need you to touch my marriage and I need you to fix it? And God, I need for you to give me the wisdom to know how to become a better parent. And God, I need for your intervention to get this person off drugs. And God, I need for you to give me a job. I'm focusing on my need all the time. Need, 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 need. My life becomes consumed with my need. And I'm looking for God's inter. God, um, God's, that's the word, you won the lottery. We're looking for God's intervention in our life. We're looking for God's intervention in our circumstance and our situation. And God's sitting saying, hold on a second, you've lost the plot here a little bit. The wilderness experience is not about your need. The wilderness experience is about you. He's looking at you and he's sitting saying, I have a plan for you that's much bigger than your need. I'm wanting to introduce you and usher you into a dimension of living that expands who you are and introduces you to a dimension of power that equips you to be able to handle the circumstances and situations in front of you. The wilderness experience is an important experience for us because from God's perspective, the wilderness experience is about a discovery. It's about us discovering new dimensions of living. It's about us discovering new facets of God and what he's all about. It's about us discovering how to move forward in our walk with God. It's about our personal growth and it's about personal expansion. It's about putting me at a place where I'm able to grow in who I am so that I'm able to take on a a higher role when it comes to governing and running the area called my garden. The... um, If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, you can just write it down. But it talks about 
the natural man is decaying, but the inner man is being renewed day by day. Each of us are walking out our own personal story of redemption. Redemption is all about salvation. And it's all about God taking us from a place where we initially just find ourselves in need of his life inside of us. And what we do is we end up moving from the kingdom of darkness and we move into the kingdom of light. And there's an automatic transformation that takes place in our lives. But then we start a journey. And the journey is a journey of discovery. The journey is a journey to, disco- to, to discover the fullness of what salvation is all about. Your salvation is not purely about getting born again. Your salva- salvation and getting born again is important. It's fundamental. It's crucial. It's, nobody wants to, to take away from it in any way. But there is so much more to the experience that God has provided for us in simply getting born again. And so as we walk out that journey and as we walk it through with him, what ends up happening is he is unfolding to us on a regular basis. He's showing us new dimensions, new aspects of who he is, more of what he's provided for us and the fullness of the life that he's created for us to live. He's putting that within us. What he's saying to us is when he's talking about the inner man and the outer man is he's saying, stop focusing on your environment. Stop focusing on your need. Stop focusing on the things that are, are, are secondary. Of primary concern to God is you. Why? Because if he's able to establish truth on the inside of you, if he's able to do something of consequence on the inside of you, by default it's gonna affect your environment. God's not aware, you sitting looking at your need and you crying out to your need and you sitting saying, God, I need you to do this and God, why aren't you doing that? And you're rolling on the floor in sackcloth and ashes and you're taking, you know, uh, you're in your prayer closet for four and a half weeks. I think it's probably because you wanted to miss the rain, but you're in there for four and a half weeks and you're praying and you're fasting and there's nothing wrong with all of those things. What I'm trying to say is this. You know what the problem with it is? The problem is we wanna know where God is. God is there, God is busy. The problem with it is, is that God is doing things that we don't think he should be doing. (laughs) We don't recognize him because God's acting in ways that we don't necessarily need him to operate in. I want God to fix my need. I don't need God to work on me. That's the truth. The wilderness experience is about personal growth. Part of the problem that we have as individuals is that we have a strange concept as as to what we believe growth is all about. You see, we believe growth is all about me having flush bank accounts. And we believe that, uh, that growth is all about my ability to cope effectively in life. And, my abi- and growth for me is all about having relationships that are good and that feed me and that are healthy and make me feel like I'm a great person. Growth for me is about being able to step up from my rambler to a double story home. That constitutes growth for me. And yet in God's economy, all of that stuff is inconsequential. In God's economy, 2 Corinthians 5.15 speaks about the fact that God wants us to change and he wants us to have a focus as to what life and growth is all about. You see, God is introducing us to the idea that growth is not about living for myself as much as it is about looking like him. You see, we caught up in the whole idea about me living a good life and me being happy and me being fulfilled and me getting all of this stuff and I like, and it's a good thing because God wants me prosperous and God wants me healthy. It's all about me. We can camouflage it and we can couch it and we can present it in very good Christianese. But the fact of the matter is that the focus is about me. God's sitting saying, it's not about you, it's about me. What I'm saying is, to what degree do you look like me? That's about personal growth. When we walk into a wilderness experience, what he's looking for is he's looking for growth in us and in who we are. He's looking for us to be a good representative of him. In essence, he's looking for us to be able to effectively represent to the world what it means to be a person who personifies love 
and power. There are many dimensions of it, but that's what he's talking about. He's talking about love and power. He is love. That's what he's all about. But he's introduced us to what it is to also live the victorious life and what it is to be a person who operates in authority. We have to have power. Who we are and what we're all about, our very character needs to be peppered and infused with his nature, which is all love. But there is a place for us where we need to walk into places of governance and God is looking for us to exercise our authority to bring about change in the world in which we invite, fight ourselves. And you're not gonna run around just loving everybody for that. There is a place where you need to exercise what it is to be a person who has power. The challenge that we have in the arena of the wilderness is that we're very comfortable coming to God with our problems, but we're not very comfortable coming to God with ourselves. I love to bring my problems to God, because you know what I can do? I just walk in there and I say, God, here it is. It's on the altar, God. I'm stepping back now. Fire from heaven, fix it. I love to bring my stuff to God because you know what? It requires nothing of me. It's easy for me to take my needs and my desires and the things that are, are problematic for me in my life and give it to God and say, do something with it. Because there's no cost associated with it. We like to think of, of Christianity, and these are all the people who are still in bed, so we can talk about them because they're not here. <laughs> But we think about Christianity as, as kind of an express drive through You know, you pull up to the drive through and they say, good morning, welcome to heaven. And you use the opportunity to let your petition be known. And when you've let your petition be known, you drive around the corner to the window and you sit there and you wait for the delivery. And Jesus, supersize it. Make it big and make it good. When we're in the wilderness, our focus is on our need. And we're looking for our need to be met. We're looking for God in his divine intervention to somehow just come through and just bam, and it happens. But I don't want to take myself to God because when I take myself to God, it's going to cost me something. <laughs> okay, block your ears for this one. You know what the problem with it is? Part of the challenge with it is we have too many lazy Christians. We have too many comfortable Christians. When you're comfortable, you don't have an appetite to change. Why? I'm comfortable. I'm life. The biggest issue in my life is, you know, do I get the iPhone or do I get the new Samsung? Ooh! No idea, because we don't, we're not hungry. We're not hungry. So it's not about us anymore. I'm happy to cruise through life, because generally things that are consequential in my life don't always happen. But when they do happen, the problem with it is I go running to God with my need. And I start saying, God, fix my need, fix my problem, fix my issue, fix my marriage, fix my kids, fix my finances, fix everything that I need. And God's saying, um, I've been waiting for you to come and chat to me. You know what the problem with it is? We don't invest in ourselves. We don't do things to put ourselves in a place that allows God to do something of consequence in our lives. Do you know how many Christians, part of the reason it's important for them to come to church is because when they don't come to church, there's nothing else the rest of the week. This is it. This is the praise and worship. This is the prayer and this is the message and this is my food and that's it. See you next Sunday. <laughs> but it's not enough to sustain us and it's not enough to position us, to put us in places of people who, govern, who are able and equipped to govern effectively. The challenge with it is we have too many Christians because they're so comfortable, don't spend the time with God that they need to 
They're not growing within themselves and they're not putting them in a place, they're not putting themselves in a place where God is able to speak into their lives, where God is able to make meaningful deposits into their life. So what he's doing is creating within them the opportunity for, to be people who have the capacity to walk into the fullness of what he has available to them. And because we don't have that within us, what we end up doing is we run to God with our need every time there's a problem. So God wants to do something in you. God's interested in you. So God's got to give you something and God's got to put something inside of you that you're able to use to affect your world and your life. God's got to give you some substance. If you don't have substance, what are you going to do? You know what the problem with it is? If you don't have substance, the only thing that you have is hope. You gotta have something to change something. If you don't have something, what have you got? I hope it works out. Because I've got nothing. So God's saying, okay, let me tell you something. Let's talk a little bit about you because I'm gonna give you something. I'm gonna give you some substance that'll change you and it'll change your world. He wants to deposit truth on the inside of us because the truth that he deposits on the inside of us becomes the substance of things that we hope for. That substance, when it is established, evidences itself in something called faith. The way that you know that that substance has taken root and is established within your life is that it develops and grows and bears a fruit called faith. There is a confidence in God that is established as a result of substance. You need to have something in order to change your world. God is giving you substance. What he's saying to you is, when I come to you and I live in you, he is in me. But that's only half the equation. He wants me to also be in him. So how do I get into him? I take of his substance. And I put his substance into my life. And when I take and put his substance into my life, there's a transformation that begins to take place in me. Not only is he in me, but I am in him. And the two work that way. Jesus is truth, right? God and his word are? One. Is Jesus part of the Trinity? Yes. Okay. So, if I take the truth of Jesus and the word of God and I put it into my life, what am I doing? I'm putting into my life substance. Substance. That's what he's looking for. Deposit substance into my life. Because when I deposit substance into my life, it creates within me the capacity to be able to use that to transform my world. It's able to influence and affect me and grow me up so that I become a person who is an effective governor in the kingdom. Your ability to govern is directly related to your maturity. If you have no substance, what are you gonna govern with? The reason he wants to establish something and put that substance into your life and put truth into your life is because what he's doing is he's growing your capacity to be a person who effectively governs. And you know what? When you begin to govern out of the truth of God's word, do you know that what ends up happening is that God commits resources to his word? God honors his word. So what he does is he commits resources, he commits power to his word. When you have that established on the inside of you and use the substance that's cre- that is on the inside of you and you take that and you deposit that into your situations and your circumstances, what you're putting in there is truth. And what God says is I will honor my word and what I will do is I will bring into play power to make sure that the word achieves and, 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 and does what it's designed to go set forth and do. He honors his word. God honors his word, but he doesn't honor your interpretation of his word. It's an important point. 
Because you see, when we take God's word and we begin to interpret God's word, what we do is we begin to define how we believe God should act. We begin to define what we think God should be doing. If I bring a need to God, God, because he loves me, should give me and meet my need. What have I done? I've walked into presumption. I've decided I can define for God how he needs to act. And God's saying, you don't decide the playing field or the rules of the game. I have decided how this is gonna operate and I have put in place a grand plan for how it's gonna operate. And that grand plan cost me a lot. It cost me the death of my son. Don't come and start telling me that I need to start acting in this way or that way. This is the problem with it is. When we get into presumption, because we're interpreting the way we think God should act, or the way that we think God should answer our prayers, or the way that we think God should do things, we enter into a situation that we're gonna become disillusioned with God. And you know what happens when you become disillusioned with God? I'll give you a clue, listen to the children of Israel. They grumbled, grumbled. Why? Because things didn't work out the way I did. You know what the problem is with grumbling? The problem with grumbling is that you open the door to the enemy to come in. Because the enemy is looking for opportunity for you to agree with him. You see, he does not have authority in your life unless you give it to him. And so the problem with it is when you get to a place where you're expecting God to do certain things and you're expecting God to deliver in certain ways and you're looking for God to do this, that, and the next thing and it doesn't work out the way that you think, the first thing people do, rather than running to God and saying, God, you know what? I must have missed it somewhere. You know what? I have a humble heart. I'm a, in humility, show me where I missed it and get me back on track with truth. You know what we do? We run off and we sit in the cycle. That's down. I knew that that prosperity stuff never worked. I knew that that stuff about what it doesn't. And what I do, I start grumbling. And the moment I start grumbling, the ears of Satan get pricked and he goes, what did you say? And he says, now let's talk about this a minute. Don't you think it's true that actually God really doesn't want you healed? He doesn't want you delivered. He doesn't want you prosperous. He doesn't want you set free. And you say, I know. You've just agreed with the devil. And when you agree with the devil, you've opened the door and you've given him authority to come into your life. What does John 10, 10 say? Thief comes to what? He's coming to steal, kill, and destroy. He's knocking on the door, and the moment you open, he's coming in. Sometimes he doesn't have to knock on the door. You got the door open, shouting out, hey! (laughs) The point of the matter is we wonder why our Christian experience ends up the way that it is, but we do things that we don't realize the implications and the repercussions of them. So we've got to start walking down avenues where we've opened the door to Satan to come into our lives and wreak havoc in our lives and then we want to know why. Because it all started when God didn't answer my prayer. It all started when God didn't meet my need. And we wonder why people end up disillusioned and shipwrecked on the rocks. Much of it is self-inflicted. It's self-inflicted. The reason that God wants to establish you in truth is because when he establishes you in truth, he positions you at a place where you're able to govern effectively according to the truth that you have. There is a difference between the fullness of God's promises that are available to you and your experienced reality. The promised land is all about the bank account. Everything that God has is available there. Everything that God and that Jesus has has done for you is available to you. But the degree to which you're going to experience it is very much defined by your personal maturity. And your maturity is an extension of the degree to which God is able to establish truth in you. God appears to Abraham, and he says to Abraham, 
I'm gonna give you a son. Took the better part of 25 years. 25 years for his son to be born. Why? We can into all kinds of speculation and they're all ideas. I'll tell you what I think. I think it took 25 years for Abraham to get established within himself that he was gonna be a father of many nations. It took him 25 years to establish the truth within him that I will be the father of many nations. And when he got that established, things happened. Children of Israel came out of Egypt, grumbling, moaning, complaining, God provided. God had a plan for them. They were his chosen people. God had a plan for them to walk into the fullness of all that he had. He wanted them to see themselves as people who were special, that were chosen and elected by God. They wa- God wanted them to come into, into relationship with him so that they could begin to understand the fullness of what that relationship meant. He wanted, them to, he wanted them to see themselves as people who could rely and work with God, rely on and work with God. It took him 40 years and eventually he said, you know what, you don't wanna do it, you'll die. And they never walked into the fullness and the promise of what he had available. It wasn't because he didn't want to give it. But all they ever did was grumble and complain. All they ever did was go to God with their needs. All they ever did was sit and say, God doesn't provide for us. They never got beyond bringing their need to God and getting to a place where they recognized that God was able to do something within them. And you know what the result of it is? If we don't take ourselves to God and we don't put ourselves in a place where he's able to work in our lives, it costs us our destiny. Your destiny is to be like him. But if you don't want to work with him, if you don't make yourself open and available to him, if you don't live in relationship with him, if you don't allow him to talk into your life, if you don't allow him to make deposits and changes in your life, what you do is you become obstructive to realizing the fullness of who he called you to be and you'll forfeit your destiny. We have a choice to make. We have a phenomenal existence. Do you know why? Why? Because God's saying, I don't want to be the God who lives up there, who just pops into your life every now and again when you have a need. I'm the God who lives inside you. The fullness of my life is on the inside of you. I am in you. But I want you to realize exactly what is available to you by you finding yourself in me. Your need is not consequential to God. It's not because he doesn't care for you. It's not because he's not interested in you. It's not because he's not focused on you. Not because he doesn't want the best for you. But he understands that if he is able to, to do something of consequence in you, it'll result in your world changing. God's dominion flows through us according to our ability to govern well. Our ability to govern well is determined by how we are governed. God will commit resources to those areas of your life where you have grown and matured in the things of God. Those things that you are walking in 
and a revelation of what he's provided for you, he will commit the resources to, and you can have dominion over those things. Your ability to govern is influenced by how you are governed. What is governing you today? How you think, how you feel, or the Holy Spirit? The word of God that's in your life. What's governing the circumstances in your life? Because what's governing the circumstances in your life, you individually, is going to determine what's governing you. What's governing you? When the word is established in us, when truth is established in us, we are governed by something that carries within it the power for transformation. And God will honor that. Amen. 